I am Jörg Wiedmann, and I'm a musician and human being, and this is Living the Classical Life. Thank you so much for being here on Living the Classical Life. It's a delight to welcome you onto the show. My pleasure. So I wanted to ask you with regards to the question of why are we even musicians today in the first place in this world? I know that you've been talking these days about beauty and dissonance. And when you look at everything that's going on in the world today, and it's hard to read the news sometimes, can beauty exist without dissonance? Can they exist without each other? It's a very good question. Uh, to me, talking about classical music and about music in general, there is a lot of beauty in dissonance, oh. I think. Mm. And if you, if you take the music of Mozart, for example, we always say, oh, it's so beautiful. Yes, of course it's beautiful. But why is it so incredibly beautiful? Because it's a beauty which is in danger. And that um, 
uh, that um, maybe answers your question in a certain way. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, opening the newspaper these days, I mean, you could easily think, well, why are we making music at all? My answer would be the opposite. Even more, <laughs> we have to make uh, music, of course. But it's not simply um, like an escapist um, uh, point of view uh, to say, well, our world is like that. And now we escape to, uh, to, to, to the music. Of course, our music or my music, also my music making, reflects today's world as well. But to answer your, your question, I really think uh, beauty is not being possible to be conceived without dissonance. And dissonance needs beauty. And there is a lot of beauty in dissonance as well. And would you say that your definition or your experience of beauty through your your life and your creative pursuits and you have many would you say that your definition of beauty has evolved so that's a tough question you know in one of the last um, books of of Baudelaire Charles Baudelaire who I always admired because he not only in his famous book, uh, The Fleur du Mal, uh, mm. he was looking for beauty in the evil, <laughs> you know? Yes. Like in the modern paintings of, of, of Francis Bacon, for example. Is it beautiful at first glance? No. Is there some even bigger beauty in his paintings and in the poetry of, of, of Baudelaire? Yes. Mm -hmm. So. In, in, in his last sketches, he calls it even rockets. It's, it's called rockets. It's just simple thoughts. You know, one thought, uh, one uh, sentence says, well, I have to go to the pharmacy get, getting this and this. And then followed by highly philosophical questions. And he has some beautiful uh, definitions of, um, of beauty. And he says that the most beautiful thing in the world, the face of a woman, he says. Mm. When is it most beautiful? If it's like a, uh, like a supermodel, you know, when everything is kind of even, you know, on the surface. No. When there is something which is not symmetrical, that makes something beautiful. That would be a nice definition of thousands of beautiful definitions of beauty. So if we think of our role in the world as artists, as musicians, and you specifically as a creator of music, are you assimilating the world and putting that into your art? Or are you, in a way, assimilating or observing the world and reacting against it? I'm thinking of perhaps Shostakovich and his output, which uh, Gergiev, for example, argued that had there not been these dictatorial forces that were causing this tyrannical fear, Shostakovich probably wouldn't have been the same composer that we know and love today. That's for sure right. Um, um, first of all, you said me as a creative artist, you know, but I think this distinction does not really work for me because when I'm on stage being a clarinetist or as a conductor, um, I think really our task is to reinvent the piece in the moment. So I hope I'm a creator in that, in, in, in that moment too. And not only when I sit at my table at home and write uh, a new piece. To be very honest, when I see certain things in our world, sometimes I'm very much opposed to, uh, to our world today, sometimes. Starting with, um, uh, with things like uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, this whole world of everybody um, telling everybody already at 9 o'clock in the morning, where am I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. The sun is going up, uh, what a miracle, come on. You yeah. know, there are st there, uh, everybody today tells everybody, you know, and also the division which goes through our society in I think almost all countries right now it's amplified by these media I think there might be positive aspects yes but 
I'm not on these media. I'm, for example, I'm not that. on. I'm not on on Facebook. I don't use it. I'm very old-fashioned in certain respects. You know, I hope I write n new music. I mean, I cannot do any differently. But um, I write uh, by hand, and when I study a Beethoven score, I find it fascinating when he creates an idea. He does not like it, and he crosses it loud out like uh, furiously. <laughs> That makes a big difference, rather than putting one, <laughs> you know, key, and that's it. And a very dangerous key is the uh, copy paste. You know, in <laughs> some in some music, I hear, you know, Bach had still had to, you know, the third time something appears, he would write a variation. Of course, today, you know, it's so easy to repeat whole parts of a of a piece of a symphony. So to these aspects of our modern life, I'm very strongly uh, opposed to, you know, I don't want to make a big philosophy out of it, but there, to these aspects, I feel like, am I really living today? Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe some people might say, well, that's really so old fashioned, yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. Today, you have to do it. No, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, in your creative impulses, do you feel like you have to construct a bit of a barrier? between yourself and the, the external forces in order to feel that you have your most creative zone? Mm, sometimes yes, but, but that's what I mean when I say I, I'm far away from being escapist, you know, because that would mean that, right? Putting a barrier here, here is the outside world, maybe the real world. No, so I'm, I'm living in our time, I'm, I'm, and I think we should be, you know, my whole um, approach of making art or of, you know, when I'm at a festival, I want to be, you know, be touched in a literal sense, but that makes me vulnerable, you know, so, so it's a very fragile thing. So, but I want to be in our world. It would be stupid to be blind or to close your eyes and say, no, I'm not aware of it. And if you look at my music theater works, for example, my first opera is about cloning. So it's really mm -hmm. about something which happens in our time. In my Babylon opera, you might say, well, that's a long time ago. But it's actually about our time because I'm deeply uh, convinced that we're actually living in a Babylonian time, in many respects. Well, I'm so curious about the fact that you bring up the concept of vulnerability because that forms the basis of certain ideals of, of beauty or exist in conjunction with, I think of the music of Robert Schumann, and oh, I know yes. that this is a particular influence for you. Oh, I nice. think Schumann, without his intensely sensitive and vulnerable uh, feelings, uh, w would not be Schumann. That's right. What was it that connected you to Schumann, and, and what drew you to his music? Oh, it was from beginning on. You know, I had a wonderful, uh, when I, w I started playing the clarinet at the age of seven and shortly after I had a wonderful Argentinian uh, clarinet teacher who conducted Cosi Fan Tutte at the same time. He played all kinds of Baroque instruments. So he was really, a, you know, this unity um, of musicianship, which was still there in former centuries, he represented that. So he was sitting at the piano, we were playing the Schumann fantasy pieces. Maybe it was a little bit too early for me, but that was my first Schumann. What other reaction can you have towards a piece like that than falling in love forever with Schumann? He was the great um, poet in music, I think. And you know, from his bi biography, his father was a librarian, so he grew up within books. And if you look at the texts he was setting to music, it's the best text. He does not do it under a certain level. What does he do? It's Goethe, it's Lord Byron, Heine, Eichendorf. It's, the, it's really the, the best um, German language. Uh, uh, I mean, Lord Byron, not, not German, but, but the best poetry po uh, um, 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 possible. So he was the, he is the poet of music. That's one aspect. Then the other one, what I was always fascinated of was, I think his melodic writing is so different from everybody. Why? Because um, 
I would describe it in terms of a kind of a fever curve, you know. So it's always this nervosity, even in slow movements. In the slowest movement, you always have this kind of thing. Once you get to know this, you get addicted to it, and it gets worse. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. I'm also thinking about Schumann's music and his role in the world after he died. Josef uh, Joachim said at the funeral, the beauty of these two people, Robert and Clara, the beauty of these people purifies us. Do you think that in the world today it's, it's also possible to have music in a purification role or is that not really, is that just sort of a, a blindly idealistic concept? Do you think of a certain role for your music in terms of the listener. Yeah, you express that very beautifully. Is it a blindly, how do you say blindly? Uh, 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 um, is is um, it idealistic? Idealistic. Yes. So uh, another word would come to my mind, which is naivety. You know, if we sit together now and we talk uh, about another person and we say, well, it's a little bit a naive person. It has a negative connotation nowadays, no? I think for making art and making music, it's kind of a precondition. Before you open a Schumann score, in a way, there should be naivety. Of course, you have, have to have knowledge, craft, all these. I'm not uh, mentioning these for now. But this naivety, I feel in his music too. And, you know, when you play his music, so I would not fear at all if if we, if we, if we are sitting here loving Schumann, would be accused of that. And by the way, he was a little bit accused of that as well, because look at his titles. There are fairy tales, you know, there were the, the cannonballs. He could hear the cannonballs in Eastern Germany at that time from the post-Napoleonic uh, Wars. What does he write? fairy tales it would be so easy to say well he escapes the reality no if you look uh, carefully at this piece which is for clarinet and uh, viola and piano which i played i did not count how many times in my life and it's a challenge each time why because it seems to be on the surface really harmless even there are some melodies bom, bing, bom, bing, bom, bing. how do you play that if you try to make art out of it it you fail. It, it, it does not work. So you need this kind of childlike naivety to play it. So that's what clarinet and viola are playing. At the same time, the piano plays bom, 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 bom. So something highly, you know, restless, not calm. So I don't want to directly link it to what was happening politically, but he was aware. And the people I admire today who write operas, like Heinz Holliger, like Helmut Lachmann, what do they write? Fairy tales. Helmut Lachmann, the match girl, this Andersen, so sad uh, uh, fairy tale. Does he escape reality? No. He is more aware than anybody else of it, but he writes a fairy tale. You know what I mean? So that would be my point. You mentioned earlier about wondering whether you're actually alive today, or if a composer is in his time, does a composer necessarily exist in his time? I think there's a certain expectation that I perceive in certain musicals, musical circles today, that a composer must be innovative, must be groundbreaking, doing new things. I'm thinking about composers like Rachmaninoff, who seemed to be a little bit uh, after the curve, but when he was asked about this later in his life, he says, perhaps that's true, but my argument is that the message of music never changes. Yes, absolutely. And we can stay with Schumann. He was accused, why is he so fascinated, and you hear it clearly in his music, by Bach and Handel. You know, this is old-fashioned. Old and he says, for, for me, it will never be old-fashioned. It will stay forever. And, and that's, that's the best answer about that. I think, but, um, you know, especially in Germany, of course, because of Hegel, the philosopher, and then later Adorno, this belief in um, that it, everything has to be innovative, you know, and if something doesn't work anymore, I mean, I, I'm really uh, simplifying 
too much the Hegel philosophy now, but you know when Greece did not work anymore, it was replaced by the Romans, and and you might know these pictures which are in music conservatories very often. This tree of music, you know, mm -hmm. starting with Monteverdi, then Bach, then comes this, and and still in the Adorno uh, philosophy. Um, there is this belief, so there is Beethoven, then comes Brahms. Because of Brahms comes the second Viennese school. Yes, in a way that's right, but isn't the beautiful thing about music history that in the same year uh, Richard Strauss writes his four last songs and the first or the second piano sonata by Pierre Boulez is written. Ba -ba, ba -ga, ba -ga, this kind of gesture and the last golden, you know, uh, dawn or, or, or sunset happens in the, the Strauss songs. For me, that's not a contradiction. I'm fascinated by both kinds of music. And even more than that, I'm interested in the people in history, in music history especially, who are too early or too late in a way. Is there a too late, you know? So, or, or take the best um, art which exists, Shakespeare, Bach. The contemporaries, or even the sons of Bach, were saying, well, that's the old world, you know, when he was writing The Art of the Fugue, Bach. Or take Shakespeare, his last, one of his last dramas, uh, Cymbeline. So you can very easily say, well, it's a, it's, it's an old, fa in, it's a drama in the old fashion, in the old style. There is still a queen, the, the, the evil queen, the princess. Uh, a very strange king who does not really realize what's happening around him, or Winter Tale, you know, by Shakespeare. But what he does with it, he just takes it, it's like um, music about music. So to me, it's very, very modern, these mm. things. So I, I think it's too simple sometimes to say, well, today somebody writes a tonal chord that's old fashioned, somebody writes a dissonance or writes an air sound, something like that. Oh, that's very modern. The, the, the air sound can be very old fashioned. It depends on the context and the tonal chord can have the function of a dissonance and of a revelation, you know. When you're setting out to write a new work, are there certain ideals that you're already putting in place? Are you trying to create really something new or, or innovative is what I'm trying to say, or are your ideals already in a different world? I try always not to bore myself in the first place. That means if I've done something, I will most likely not do it again in the same way. That's why in aesthetics, talking about aesthetics, people might, might be surprised if they hear two or three pieces of mine, and they even might ask themselves, well, is this piece really written by the same composer? <laughs> That's you know, and you might say this this is innovative or not. At the starting a piece, this question is is of no interest for me at all. I have an idea. I get obsessed about it. Um, I stay with this idea for weeks. I doubt the idea. You know, because it's an idea. It's so pure. You know, it just is there. But is it my did I do something for it? No. <laughs> so what happens many times with me is that I fight against my own idea so much. So I develop a thousand ideas and reasons against the original idea. And at a certain point, I start, <laughs> you know. So but this question, <coughs> is it innovative in the end, you know? I don't know. What happens sometimes? You write hundreds of pages for, uh, of sketches for an orchestral piece and suddenly there arrives a moment and you feel very clearly there has never anybody been there. You know, it's like when you hear the Schoenberg, um, you know, chamber symphony with this incredible beginning, you know, <laughs> bom, 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 bom. never anything in music history was like that, you know. It's not like opening politely a door with your hands. It's with your foot, back, like a big <laughs> door, you know. Suddenly we are in, in 20th century. When this motif comes again in the slow movement, 
boom, boom, boom. And each of these notes is sustained by, <coughs> by another instrument. I always feel, have a feeling of, I have goosebumps now when we talk about it, like the first man on the moon, you know, something like that. Sometimes in my music, as I say, not on page one for sure, but sometimes on page hundred something, I have the impression, well, I'm the first one here. But still, I would not say that's something good or bad, but I feel it sometimes. Okay, so you're the composer of the piece, obviously. But do you ever feel like you've started this work and then in a strange way, it's taken on a life of its own that oh, had yeah. nothing to do with your original oh, yes. idea? And that's the problem. That's where the problem starts. That's why composing is always a challenge and an adventurous thing. For example, at the beginning of the piece, you, you start with a, with a distant trumpet, and you are sure after 45 minutes, this distant trumpet has to come again. You write a year or two years on that piece with that knowledge. Then you arrive at that moment when the distant trumpet should come again, and it's not necessary anymore. Isn't, isn't that incredible? That happens to me so many times. And that's a real conflict. I mean, we can talk about it now and I can say, well, this happens here. This yeah. But, <coughs> but I'm not at all, you know, um, how do you say, is a sovereign, so, so, a sovereign uh, in, in that moment at all. I'm extremely insecure. Why? Because do you give your original idea simply away uh, only because the piece wants to go somewhere else? Do you really, when you have worked for a year for that idea, do you throw it out of the window and say goodbye? Or, and that is the case most of the time, I would say, you started something and it gets a life of its own. And the piece, 99%, the piece is more right than I am as the one who writes it. There are some moments when you have to insist on it. You know, you have to, I have the feeling, maybe that's another wrong uh, decision I make. But this decision making in com composing, that's the toughest thing for me. You know, having an I idea, you know, my problem in composing is not not having enough ideas, sitting there and waiting for, <laughs> You know, the, do you know this cartoon uh, of Brahms sitting at the Thun Lake in, in, in Switzerland? <laughs> because he was famous for not having melodic ideas in the Romantic era. Can you imagine? <laughs> and he sits there trying to catch an, a melody. Okay, again, failed. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's ridiculous because we love uh, Brahms as, as, as a, a melody writer. But you know, this happens so many times that the piece goes to a different direction, and rightly so. But in the very moment when you sit there, it's a struggle. So then the next variable, do you sometimes conceive of a work differently or create it differently if you have a specific performer in mind? Yes. And I, th I think of this because on our show we have had Yefim Bronfman, yes. your friend, and yes. he has played your, your concerto. Yes. For me, if I knew that he was going to be playing your work, you would probably conceive of the process a little bit differently? Yes, absolutely. And also, you know, in German there is this wonderful word Klangkörper, which is sound and body in one. So you call an orchestra sound body, which I find so beautiful. Because music, if I conceive a note, to me it's a, it's a living it's a human being with some kind of start, you know, a body and an end, you know. So when I write for an orchestra, a specific orchestra like the Vienna Philharmonic, or in this case uh, for FIMA, uh, uh, for the Berlin Philharmonic, of course this plays a, a very important role. And FIMA, you know, he's effortless, you know, he has this incredible energy and power in Incredible. his playing, you mentioned uh, Rachmaninoff and so on, so, so you, you need it for, for this kind. He has this impact, but there's at the same time an incredible tenderness about his playing. So my piece 
is very much about also his playing. So I had the privilege to work with most wonderful pianists. So when I write for Andra Schiff, it's w the piece will be different. When I write for Mitsuko Ichida, it will be a very different piece in, in a way. And for Jeffrey Bronfman and with the two others also, we were on stage together. Hmm. We played with uh, uh, Jeffrey Bronfman. I played a recital at the Lucerne Festival, you know, the really traditional pieces, the Brahms sonatas, Alban Berg, who we adore, both of us, and so on. We played my music. I, uh, he. Uh, played the piece. I already had written a piece, we are sitting in New York now, for <laughs> Carnegie Hall. I had uh, written a piece for him, The Eleven Humoresques, which is, of course, as the title suggests, a clear Schumann, Schumann reference. Uh, <laughs> uh, reference. And so, absolutely, yes, I don't write abstract pieces, you know, very rarely. If I know it's for this person and for this player, it will be different. You were talking about Yefin Bronfman and your collaboration. What was that like? Yeah, he also has a wonderful uh, sense of humor next to uh, to all his you know abilities <laughs> on the on the piano, and I remember that uh, once I was playing uh, a concert in New York at Lincoln Center, and he came to the concert, and then uh, he did not come to congratulate afterwards because we knew we would meet at his apartment afterwards, and he was preparing <laughs> some food and this famous wine, which is named after him, the Femasaurus, <laughs> exactly, the Femasaurus. And when we were sitting there, he was, uh, we were talking about, uh, clarin uh, about clarinet playing, of course, because he had heard me playing the clarinet. And he said, um, can you imagine, we are sitting in this apartment now, and many, many years ago, the phone was ringing. So I picked up, and can you imagine what the voice at the other end said, my name is Benny Goodman. Can I talk to, to Fima Bronfman? And you know what Fima said? He said, yes, and my name is Vladimir Horowitz. And he hung up. He He did not believe him. <laughs> so, but he called again, and it was Benny Goodman. And he wanted to play the Brahms sonatas in private with him. And they actually did at this apartment. I had goosebumps when I heard this story. <laughs> is this? Yes, and my name is Vladimir Horowitz. <laughs> and hang up. I love this. Oh, yeah. okay. So, so Fima has this fantastic sense of humor. Um, how important is humor in in your life? Because I, I ask because I feel like a lot of people are so serious about it. Oh, it's so important in a well understood sense. You know, in a, Sh a Schumann sense. You know, when uh, one example, Schumann writes. Uh, uh, over his um, Opus 102, Stücke im Volkston Cello Piano, mm -hmm. he writes mit humor, with humor. Mm -hmm. How does it start? No, and also the piece itself is called Vanitas Vanitatum from the book Ecclesiastes. <laughs> so everything is in vain. So one of the darkest, most pessimistic texts of the world's literature he writes with humor, and the music sounds <laughs> What kind of humor is that? Yes, humor is the most important thing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, what happens, and is there perhaps a risk in this? Do you sometimes envision the audience reaction and write accordingly? Is there a risk in keeping in mind how your piece will be perceived? Uh, to be very honest, no. Uh, I'm sorry to say, I know that some films today, mainstream blockbuster movies, they are done like that. I've wis witnessed it, you know. So they have the, the film ready, and then there's a test audience. So then they ask the, the audience, how did you think about the actors? How was the music? And if it gets a kind of bad grade, they might change it. I cannot make art like that. There I'm a Schoenbergian. <laughs> Absolutely. He says in, 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 in German, I don't know how, it's, uh, how that's in English, uh, Kunst kommt nicht von Können. So art making does not come from knowledge and being able to, to do it. You can doubt that sentence very much, mm -hmm. that half sentence, but it comes from müssen. So I have to do it. This is this very Schoenbergian, I, and you hear it in, in his music very clearly talking about my music, if I have to write a tonal piece, like my octet, for example, I, I accept, of course, I know from a certain side there will be a huge criticism. 
uh, from the same people, they will love my uh, piece for, for a modern music festival because it consists of dissonances and all kinds of noises. But that's a wrong approach, I think. I think. So I don't ask myself that at all. But what is very present for me, we were talking about performers, that's the room mm. and the hall it, is, it will be performed at. That plays a certain role. So when I go to sleep and I know during a composition process it will be played at this hall, that plays, plays a very, very important role. But just imagine if I would be like that and if I would anticipate a possible audience reaction. You know, the lady, uh, charming lady in the second row will have completely different feelings than, than, than the woman in the fifth, you know. You know. So once you start to do that, you, you, how do you say this in English? You sell, you're selling your soul. You know, you give away what you believe in. I can only do what I believe in and believe me, I have enough doubts about it. So sometimes for me it's not even sure what I want. But once I want something, I cannot make a survey. Do you like it too? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but we do also care about our audiences. So what happens if, hypothetically, an audience member came to you and rudely let you know that they did not like your specific work. It happens. What, what would you... Yeah, <laughs> it happens for my performances too, but I didn't write them. <laughs> so then it's on me as a performer. But what happens if they say this to you? Okay, specifically to you, but also for, for new music. Yeah. What do you say to the people who have heard a work for the first time and do, say they do not like it? Well, first of all, I, I was very, very lucky in my life. So, so far, um, my experience was even if it's harsh dissonances in a piece and if it's very hard to hear, even a long piece, if the people feel that the composer, the creator had to do it that way, they will listen. They might not like it in the end, but they will be with us. So I really believe in that. So really to say it once more, I cannot <laughs> anticipate or react to that or if somebody of course I mean again vulnerability you know uh, Bruckner so one friend said well your last movement is too long he would start changing it the other one said no no leave yes. it like it so he would Rachmaninoff he would too by the way absolutely so when I friends artist friends I really believe in it makes me think hmm. sometimes after a performance even if nobody talks to me I might change something if I feel something is, is wrong. But you, this situation you are mentioning, somebody after a concert comes to me and complains about the piece. To be honest, that moment it's too late anyway. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can talk to this person and try to convince him, well, but look at bar 15, how cleverly this is, is, is done or what, whatever, I don't know. Um, it's too late anyway. If, if this person does not like it, it's too late. But you know what I prefer if somebody comes or in an audience reaction, somebody makes clear, I did not like that at all, or I loved it, the, it's much nicer and much better than this, you know, clapping, oh, modern piece, okay, it has to happen anyway. Let's look forward to the second half uh, romantic symphony. <laughs> yeah. That's much worse. So strong reaction, why not? Jörg, I'm hearing you describing your, your musical life and your interests and your love of literature and composers. And I'm struck by perhaps a certain energy in your life. Where did your curiosity come from? <laughs> Was that there from an early age? Was that in your family? So my sister and, and I, my sister is a wonderful violinist. Indeed. <laughs> and and uh, so we grew up. Um, uh, our parents were not professional musicians, not at all. They had <laughs> decent <laughs> jobs. <laughs> like my, my mother was a was a was a teacher. My uh, my my father was a, a physicist. Physicist is that right? Mm -hmm. um, um, he was into uh, microelectronics. Microelectronics, and uh, but they were very open towards music, and they took us to concerts, and they had an amateur string quartet at home. So that, I think, that played a very, very important role. And from beginning on, I don't know why, at the beginning more than painting, which is so important for me today as well, I, I was obsessed about poetry. You know, when I, 
when I read the also too early maybe I did not really get it but when I read the, my first Baudelaire and Rilke for uh, most uh, I mean I I fell in love with it it's my old dream um, to set to music uh, his sonnets to Orpheus but something keeps keeps me away from it uh, because it is already music you know one of the poems starts with the word gong you know <laughs> who am i to do i to have a tam tam no i mean i could translate it in, in in a certain way um but for me it was always always equally also as a clarinetist by the way equally at least equally interesting to listen to violinists to pianists to horn players i love the horn you know the the way they can create legato there is something in between sometimes i artificially try to create that on the clarinet so some clarinet colleagues say so don't make your life so difficult you know just play the notes but you know <laughs> I, I mean i'm simplifying it but but in Schumann fantasy pieces, for example, these big dissonances, which, you know, there's this version for cello, piano as well, and for, for clarinet. For clarinet was the first version, I have to insist. But, but I love the distances on the cello. Wow, these big distances. For us, it's pressing keys. I exaggerate. So I try with my air and even kind of glissando movements to create these 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 things so all these things are important for me not only you know only the the music itself for me that's also interesting theater opera i mean how can you play mozart without interest in interest for theater for 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 opera there's this wonderful uh, letter by mozart to his father writing about shakespeare hamlet the appearance of the ghost and he writes what an incredible moment so you can see he was in the theater the other day and he's still fascinated about it and then he criticizes shakespeare and he says well wouldn't the whole scene be much stronger if it would be much shorter is <laughs> that incredible we wow. always have this this image of mozart so everything was easy for him so kind of no, he was reflecting on theater, of course. Otherwise, you cannot write uh, Don Giovanni. I think he, Mozart even put in another letter. He said, don't think that just because I have done it a lot that it comes easily to exactly. me. Exactly. Or take something like the end of Jupiter's Symphony, where he has five themes happening at the same time without sounding like only dissonant stuff. It's, it, you know... I even think in, in, in Mozart, who would be another uh, composer next to Schumann, who I love most, mm. uh, I would even say, you know, with Mendelssohn, at a very early stage, uh, when he was 12, 13, he could write fugues. The, the, the sheer craftsmanship of this young Mendelssohn, it's incredible. With Mozart, it was not like that when it comes to fugue writing, when it comes to contrapuntal writing. I think for Mozart it was difficult. I once played in a historical room uh, in in Vienna, the today Academy of the of Sciences, where Mozart performed, um, very over acoustic hall, which was interesting. We would call it over acoustic at that <coughs> time. It was supposed to be a, a normal hall, and we played not the famous clarinet quintet of Mozart, but the Köchel 516C with the Hagen Quartet. We played the famous Mozart Quintet, and this one. And interestingly enough, this piece, he stopped, he gave it up in the first movement, beginning of development section. And he has almost Beethoven like, bing, boom, big jumps. That would be the moment when he has to work, really. For some reason, that was the moment <laughs> where he left it. And there are many seven bar exercises in counterpoint of Mozart. And now with my Irish chamber orchestra, we play at Carnegie uh, uh, in two days, the Adagio and Fugue by Mozart. That's another piece. I think he wanted to prove to his circle among Baron van Swieten, who showed him all these Bach and Handel scores in his library. So he was so interested in that. So he wanted to prove he can write in that style. There's another letter of Mozart where he praises himself for, OK, I could write in the Italian style, in French style, and so on. But it's always him, you know, he never 
You know, he can, he can do it. But I really believe that counterpoint was something very difficult for him. Therefore, in the works where he uses it with this incredible mastery, but with fiery, you know, um, so the imagination is still in the foreground. It's not this kind of academic counterpoint, which I am so opposed to in all centuries, you know. Once it starts, you know how it, how it goes on for the next five minutes. Yeah. It's inspired counterpoint in Mozart, but it was difficult for him. But he gets even more depth in what he wants to express if he uses counterpoint like in the Jupiter Symphony in the end. I'm so curious to know on the subject of how music is notated, if you think it's possible to encode a feeling into notation. <laughs> That's what I'm dealing with all my life, and I'm failing in different <laughs> <laughs> ways. Uh, how is this? Who, who said this? Was it Beckett, you know, uh, fail, uh, try again, yeah. uh, try again, fail better? Fail. I, <laughs> I, I always uh, uh, like this approach, and that's very clearly when we talk about notation. I have an idea. So what are we doing as composers? We write dots and dashes and hope that somebody else understands it. You know, so that's basically notation. Um, we mentioned my sister, so I had the privilege to grow up w with her, and we really developed new sounds for the violin. By the way, not waking up in the morning trying to be especially innovative today. You know, <laughs> we just we were children. You know, and we tried, and so I was always um, because I was always writing in the night my pieces for a long time since six, seven years, not anymore. My body told me very clearly it's enough. So I write during the daytime, but at that time I was writing during the night. So I was leaving letters at the breakfast table for her. So asking what happens when you turn the violin upside down, you with 100% pressure, <coughs> you do this. So when I woke up, I got an answer letter from her. For, which always started the same, you are crazy. <laughs> that was, that's how it started always. And she, most of the time she said, it's not possible, but by trying, I discovered something else. And that's the kind of innovation which I like. It's a childlike, you know, being curious. When I'm backstage with a horn player before Schubert Octet, and he plays something like that, kind of a wolf uh, sounds. I, I say, and they say, go on stage. I say, one minute, please. How do you do this? You know, that's, that's, uh, so how do I notate it? In my violin etudes for my sister, I also asked her, how do I notate it? For some of the sounds, it needs an explanation, like, uh, like in a scientific <laughs> work, you, the, the foot, uh, no, how do you say the, the, um, the, the remarks? Oh yeah, the, uh, the, the footnotes. Yes. Footnotes, yes. exactly. So, some of the sounds, it needs a, a physical explanation. Do this with your left hand without uh, forgetting the r with the right hand doing this and that. So I'm, as a musician, being a music musician myself, I want to be as precise as possible for my fellow colleagues, for my musician friends, when I describe something like that. Sometimes I try to create a new sign for that, so the musician sees, okay, that's the sign it, it already, um, happened at some other place before, but it's in each new piece because I create new sounds almost in every piece. I don't know if that's right, but it requires a new notation, you know. There was a, a moment actually in, I believe, the third etude. So there's a, a video on YouTube. Your sister is playing this as, I believe, an encore. Yes. And I, oh, there was what? a moment there that I wanted to ask about because it seemed to me, I'm not a violinist, so I wouldn't know the, the technique, but it seemed like there was a slide which was going across being handed over to different strings. Yes. I have not witnessed that elsewhere. Per yes. Perhaps there are other moments like that other, of other composers. But how, how does that occur to you, other than maybe you were holding the violin and maybe just messing around with some motions or something? How did you come up with it? I've never heard a violin sound like that. As in our whole conversation, I will be very honest. You know how it happened? It happened when my sister practiced next door and something else. So it sounded so modern to me. I was so impressed. So I knocked on the door. So I asked, what are you playing? What modern piece are you playing? She was playing Isaiah. 
Oh. Wie sehr? So, kind of traditional uh, 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 violin etudes. And she showed me this technique because it sounded so difficult. And she said, no, it's actually not that difficult. I do this on this string, then on the A string, then on the D, then ah. on the G string. And then I said, what would happen if one does it with glissando as well? And she said, I never tried. And that was that's the beginning. That's how the idea for the third etude started. When I look at your biography, and, and I realize that you're still a very young composer by the standards of some, other, uh, some others who have lived a much longer time. You are right. To some others, I'm already very old. <laughs> old. <I think. laughs> Schubert. Schubert. <laughs> Mozart also. <laughs> so if I think of that, and I look at your list of accomplishments, compositions, recordings, orchestras, residencies, awards, that's one thing to look at, but if we are also talking about being the vulnerable artists we are, that disguises that a, a little bit and the, and the difficulties that come with the processes. Do you feel like you are naturally a resilient person in the face of those vulnerabilities? So you mentioned the amount of, 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 of my works. To be very honest, I have the feeling that I'm lazy. <laughs> really, oh. really, really. You know, most of the time, and I enjoy so much doing nothing. And by the way, for the creative process, it's also so important to look at the empty wall, mm -hmm. you know, but without wanting to be creative afterwards. You know, it's just uh, without um, kind of zen-like, you know, not thinking so I look at the wall now I try to get empty because I desperately need to write my next trick <laughs> the next morning then it will never work you know if you want something too much in that's my experience then it then it will not work sometimes I'm surprised too when I look at the amount mm -hmm. of things I am written but I think because there is a certain obsessiveness about w once I start because once I start, um, maybe that explains it best. So my body is tired after a whole day and mm -hmm. two nights of composing nonstop. So I um, turn off the light and I go to sleep. Of course, like it's like with the clarinet. Sometimes the fingers continue playing Mozart clarinet concerto. So they don't want to sleep yet with composing it's even worse sometimes because the double basses they in my imagination they continue of course <laughs> so why sleeping so most of the time i <laughs> switch on the light again i go back because it would be much worse trying to fall asleep you know <laughs> you know so so once i sit there i would really describe it like that there's the table there is a magnetism going away it's a, it's against me for weeks that's what I tried to describe. You have an idea and then you have these thousand ideas against it. But once I sit there, basically I will not stand up again and, uh, and, and do something else. Of course I eat, I do all kinds of things. But basically I don't stop until I've created my, my idea. And you know, everybody is different. You know, like a, a, a colleague of mine who I, uh, really admire so much, like George Kurt Kurtak, or uh, a composer who is not alive anymore, Anton Webern. They did not write much, but every note kind of a masterpiece. There are composers who write a lot, and it's very <laughs> different. There, there are very few composers like Mozart who wrote incredible amount of music, and really almost everything is, let's face it, uh, a masterpiece. <laughs> you know, so it's all kinds of different pieces. It has to do with the body, with the physicality of somebody. For me, if I for weeks don't write music, it, I get nervous, I, I get sick even. I, I have to continue. When I wrote my Babylon opera, the second scene is the flood scene. Mm -hmm. Because you know, the Babylonians, the Jews and the Christians, they believed in the idea of the, f of the flood, which I 
which I find so interesting because it's, our, it's this human question. Why, if there is God or if there are gods, why do they do this to, to us people? And it says in the Bible, you know, he created us um, as a mirroring him. H him, how, how is it uh, literally? I don't know. But, you know, so we are uh, mirroring him. What does that say psychologically after Freud about God, <laughs> you know? When he, we, when he killed us, except, you know, a few, few animals, only a pair of each animal kind and of, of Noah uh, and, and his, his family. What does that mean? So anyway, so I was in the middle of this process of writing the flood and I got sick because, you know, I was hit by my own music, the first wave. That was the first of 25 of these waves. I could only get healthy again by continuing. Mm. It sounds uh, extreme and maybe exaggerated, but it, it was like that. Okay, so if your compositional process, as you've described it so far, is really about a pursuit of obsessions, I can also imagine that there must be periods where things feel m more difficult or perhaps they, oh, don't, they yes. don't happen at all. What do, what do you do during these, these periods to try to help it? Is it a question of stepping away? Oh, it's, it's, it's so tough. Again, we are sitting here. I can talk about this experience, about this piece. You know, now when I will uh, return to Berlin, to my working table, it will happen to me again. And I will not have the proper answer. You know, that's, mm. that's, it's, it's different each time. Sometimes you have to step back. Sometimes, you know, walking <laughs> helps. Simply saying, I cannot solve this right now. And I walked Beethoven for Beethoven. It was very important. So the people asked Beethoven, so do you have something to write with you on your walks mm -hmm. to notate your ideas? And he said, no, <laughs> because this idea, which you have already forgotten when you return back home, is not even worth of, of writing it down. So I, 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 I kind of like this. So that would be the more important part of my answer. Each time when it happens again, I don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in, in my early cello concerto, it was, it took me one year. I could not continue. Because um, the cello, kind of the hero of the piece, even in a romantic sense at that time, I was, <laughs> I was uh, yeah, it was in 1999 when I wrote it. Um, this hero is replaced by two singers two women, which run on stage, two demons, two angels, one demon, one angel, one does not really know. So the cellist is silent suddenly. So he is replaced by them. And the simple question, if the cello comes back again at the end of the piece or not, hmm. I could not decide it for a whole year, you know. In the end, I decided the cello returns until today. I'm not so sure if it was the right decision. And this is following along with that, and this is perhaps a difficult question, but if you can think of all of your compositions and the process that led to their creation, is there one that is particularly close to your heart for the reason that it felt like some miracle that it actually did uh, reach completion? Yes, the Babylon Opera. Mm. Because it represents this whole problematic field and fascinating field we are just discussing. Why? Because when I start a piece, I write a note, already the second note feels wrong, I promise you. At the beginning, it feels all wrong. But in the end, in the last days, I have the impression, maybe I'm wrong, but I have the impression Yes, it's so obvious. It has to be a B-flat here. Here comes the oboe, here the English horn, here the double bass. Of course. So maybe I'm too critical with myself at the beginning of a piece, and maybe too enthusiastic at the end of a piece. But writing the Babylon opera really uh, represents this problem at its best. You know, how to start a, th a two and a half hour long opera on this topic for huge orchestra forces, 100 people orchestra, 100 people chorus, 
20 to 30 soloists, I think. So how do you start a piece like that? It starts with the libretto. Uh, uh, it starts with which language to use. And of course, since it was Babylon, my, libra my librettist, the wonderful philosopher, uh, Peter Sloterdijk, he was interested in all kinds of things, but not in what I was interested in, in the first place, the confusion of languages. And I was discussing with him and he was not interested. You know, all kinds of things. I learned so much from him about ancient Babylon. But at some point it was clear, okay, the confusion of languages has to happen in the music, in the orchestra pit. So that was a decision. So until I could start, it took me one and a half years. I remember I was so late, I feel guilty, <laughs> that they were in the last rehearsals already, you know, stage orchestra <laughs> rehearsals. And Kent Nagano, the conductor, um, who was supporting the whole project so much, he said to me, you know, Jörg, you know, tomorrow we have our last stage orchestra rehearsal. The next rehearsal we have is the dress rehearsal and that's public. So basically it's a performance. We need to have your thing finished tomorrow morning. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and the whole seventh tableau of it, so it's in seven because that's the Babylonian number, seven they believed in. The, they created our week as we have it, the seven days week. Hmm. And in the Bible, they kind of copied that. They were strongly opposing the Babylonians, but this they happily <laughs> took. To the, so our, in the Christian world, this was also created on the seventh day, right? So, but it comes from the Babylonians, this, mm. this idea. So anyway, the seventh tableau, not only because I was under pressure, not at all, but the seventh tableau I wrote in a kind of ecstatic state of, you know, Nietzsche believes very much in, in that, you know, the ecstasy, that's the clearest moment, you know, it's not kind of distorted or something, no, then you think uh, most, uh, most clear, clearly, and that was, that was to me personally a miracle. It's, I think, 15 minutes of music, this last scene, and I wrote it only in a few days. That's a miracle for me. And, but still listening to it today, and I did a new version, and I changed many things, but this last tableau, except I added another ending, I did not change that. It felt right in the moment, and it is right for me. Many other things were not right. I cut them out of the piece and tried to write a new version. But I would mention the Babylon Opera, which maybe represents anime, anyway what I believe in, in our world. I mean, that brings us back to the beginning of our conversation, politics today and the world and the arts. I think I can answer better than in words in my Babylon Opera the relation between these two things. Do you feel more at ease in one capacity or the other in your musical life? You're, of course, a prolific composer. You are a performer on the clarinet. You taught many years in Freiburg. That's right. As a clarinet teacher. And you're a conductor. D do you feel certain risks? And, and I have a musically diverse life as well. And, and it, the question is always, how, how do you balance between all the projects that you feel passionate about without having the quality of one take away from the quality of the other? Yeah. Is that a balance that you ever had to struggle with? I rather think that the different aspects are inspiring hmm. each other and I get energy from it. You know, for example, now we are on tour, I'm conducting and I'm, I'm playing. Usually, still 10 years ago, in the nights I would compose, I don't do this anymore. <laughs> so I'm a player and, and, and conductor in these days. I took my whole December off for composing, so that would be a practical, maybe disappointing answer, but that would be a practical aspect I'm forced sometimes to, when I wrote the Babylon Opera, I had to take five uh, months off. I could not, you cannot really uh, be on stage every night when you write an opera of that scale, of that, you know. It's not, it's simply not possible. But at the end of the day, you know, now being traveling, it takes away energy. Yes, I admit it. But once the orchestra is even tuning and then starting with the first Mendelssohn chord, Oh, I get so much energy. So I will come back in a week, 
uh, to my place uh, in Berlin. So I live in Munich, which I'm more and more, the more I travel, I'm more, more and more homesick for where, <laughs> I, where I live. But also I live in Berlin and I will compose. You know, I meet here so many people, which is wonderful. But then it's equally wonderful to close my door and to continue my string quartet number seven. After this period, after finishing the string quartet, which requires even loneliness, you know, I don't want to sound too romantic, but it, I mean, loneliness is too much, but it requires a lot of sitting, you know, and, you know, persistence, you know, in what you're doing. Then I'm so happy when middle of January, I am playing and conducting again. I'm lucky. We musicians in general, I think, we are so lucky. I mean, how many uh, people have a profession? They're so bored uh, uh, from <laughs> during daytime mm -hmm. that they have to freak out in the, in, in the night. We can freak out constantly in a way, you know, in a Nietzschean way, you know, freak out in a, yeah. you know. <laughs> we are privileged, really. Sometimes we should not forget. We should not forget we are so, so privileged that we are allowed to make music. I'm wondering about your life as a composer. What percentage of your year is on the road? Very much. <laughs> Most of it. I mean, I failed and I still fail in, in having these periods to save myself from, from that. And you know, a composition does not ask, does your next tour start next month? If the piece takes longer, it will take longer. And I'm in constant conflict with that. When I was on my last tour with my orchestra, with Irish Chamber Orchestra, it was in the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires mm. and in South America. I was hating myself for it, but I was, could not finish a piece which I would lo love to have finished two months uh, uh, before that. It was uh, premiered on my birthday, therefore I, I will not forget it, middle, <laughs> middle of June. It was for Daniel Barenboim and his Boulez Ensemble in the new Boulez Hall um, in Berlin. And it was two weeks before the performance of one and a half. Before our last concert at the Teatro Colón, I was writing nonstop 14 hours. I really tried to avoid these things. But it, it was like that. At the same time, it was one of our most beautiful concerts. I mean, we were lucky too. It could be the other way too. It's, it's, it's risky. I'm not saying I don't want to promote <laughs> this, this way of, of, of working. But you know what I'm, I'm saying? The piece did not ask me, you know, are you on tour in South America? But I could not deliver the piece because it was not finished. I had to continue it. So there are conflicts, yes, I admit, and I will never really solve them until I stop one of the things which I don't want to do because I get a lot of inspiration from all of these aspects. You've accomplished so much already. Do you feel like there is more in perhaps a different capacity of musical life that you still wish to accomplish? <laughs> <laughs> You're the first one to ask me that. Normally, I'm asked that how much and how uh, in, in many, how many fields I, I, I do things, and if I shouldn't do less. You ask me if there is even something else. <laughs> That's a very nice aspect. I like this. Um, well, I mean, when it, I stay in the musical field, but it still goes beyond it. Once you have started uh, creating music theater you are confronted with light, you know. I always had a dream to do a project only light and music, even without drama. I once had, since we are in America here, I had long conversations with a wonderful and from me deeply admired artist, uh, James Terrell, mm. who, who I admire so much. I wrote a whole cycle of Lichtstudie, studies on light, inspired by him, and we planned a project. It did not work out, but we, we, we already started conversations like that. That would be something I dream about. To create a form of music theater which didn't exist. What I'm very curious about is, is dancing, belly. I never 
was in, in, in this field. I'm very interested in that. Here in New York, in, when I studied here at, at Juilliard, at the New York City Theater, where all these uh, Georges Balanchine productions were, and, you know, Agon, one of the, the, the late pieces of Stravinsky. What an incredible piece, what an aesthetic, together with, and he wrote it, we were talking about if it's, if I write, especially for a certain performance. So they were collaborating closely together. That would be a field I'm, I'm very, very curious about. You know, since my last music theatre projects were so exhaustingly big, I was really exhausted. Once I got a letter from the uh, director of the Vienna State Opera shortly after I finished Babylon, if I would be interested in writing an opera for them, and what an honor to be asked by the Vienna State Opera. I wrote him literally, and he was calling back ver in a very nice way. I said, even the thought of a new uh, opera causes stomach problems <laughs> for me. That was my honest answer, you know. But one day I have to write a new music theater because each time I did music theater, I learned something new and I was confronted with something. In Paris, in, at the Bastille Opera, I did once with uh, the figurative artist uh, Anselm Kiefer. I did uh, um, a piece which maybe as a whole failed, but there were some aspects in it which are so interesting and did not, exact, uh, did not exist in such way. So that would be my answer. In music theatre, yes, I have many dreams. And finally, what's inspiring you these days, musically or otherwise? Oh, you know, <laughs> being, you know, having played a concert uh, uh, last night, you know, it will always be Mozart, Mendelssohn, the, the best music, most inspiring music. But there's always new stuff. I'm interested in what the young generation does. I, I still teach, you know, so I am inspired by them. So they come to me and say, oh, listen to that. Always, anything. You know, when I grew up, over my wall of my room, over my bed, next to uh, pictures of women, of course, <laughs> uh, there, were, there, were, there were two pictures of artists I admired. One was Pierre Boulez, the other one was Miles Davis. So for me, it's this range. It's, I, I, I'm so inspired still by somebody like Miles Davis. I believe in, in, I'm most fascinated, let's put it that way, I'm most fascinated in these kinds of artists who always had the ability to do something new and be, be curious. You know, Picasso, when people thought, so, so now he has his blue period. He was somewhere else already when these lines were printed. In Miles Davis, the same. When people said, so now he's doing cool jazz, he was somewhere else already. Hmm. So it's the death of the arts if we is a standstill. So let's search for the new. Jörg, thank you so much. So it was such a pleasure you. to have you here it's on the show pleasure. and to converse about life in a way that has personally inspired me very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.